Hi, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Thank you for joining our live today from WHO headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we are live today on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about uh, coronavirus or the COVID-19, uh, as you have heard uh, in the news uh, a lot. Um, <clears throat> So the disease have affected uh, people from many countries and uh, in January uh, 2020, WHO have declared it as a public health of emergency. And uh, for this outbreak, uh, we know that we are not only fighting the virus, uh, but we are also uh, managing uh, stigma, fear and discrimination. So today uh, I'm sitting here with our mental health expert, uh, Aisha Malik to talk about uh, why is it important to, um, to talk, to understand about the mental health aspect uh, on this disease. So Aisha, can you explain to our uh, audience today, um, why is it important to, to understand about the mental health on mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19? Thanks, Sari. <coughs> so as Sari said, we're not just talking about an outbreak of COVID-19 what we're also seeing is an increase in the anxiety that people are experiencing. So it's really important to think about um, mental health as part of the public health response to COVID-19. We know that in emergency situations that mental health can uh, decline in the population and that there's a higher rate of mental health conditions. So people who uh, might be vulnerable to experiencing mental health uh, or stress during this time might include people who have pre-existing mental health conditions or substance use conditions in the community or who might represent other vulnerable groups who are vulnerable to stress. So we're not just talking about protection from COVID-19, but we're also talking about prevention of stress and fear during this uh, event as well. Thank you, Aisha. And um, uh, if you have any questions uh, for Aisha around the mental health on uh, COVID-19, the, the new mm -hmm. coronavirus, um, send in your question as comment on Facebook and LinkedIn. And on Twitter, uh, you can tweet and use hashtag AskWHO. Um, so Aisha, there's a lot of fear spreading right mm -hmm. now uh, around the new coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, should we actually be scared um, or is it a, a big, the result of um, the spread of misinformation uh, that people see mm -hmm. in social media in the news can you mm -hmm. tell us more about that sure so uh. fear is a response to perceived or actual threat or danger and closely linked to that is anxiety or worry or stress which can come about when things are uncertain or unknown or unclear to us. And as COVID-19 is a new virus, and as we are still learning very much about this, although tremendous work has already taken place already to learn about the virus, it naturally can elicit these types of feelings. So you will hear this message repeated quite a lot, but it's really important to bear in mind that fear and anxiety is part of the normal response to this new situation. So many things can cause fear, and one of those things are the, is misinformation and rumors. So this is something that can exacerbate people's fear, and it's why a repeated message for managing fear in the COVID-19 response is to, to get facts. So facts minimize fear. Um, and these facts can be obtained from credible sources or trusted scientific sources. For example, WHO um, or your national or local public health body as well. Um, in, in terms of fear, many of you might not uh, think that you are experiencing fear or worry, or some of you might be thinking that way. It can express itself in various different ways. So you might be experiencing a high level of questions uh, that you're as asking yourself or a high number of thoughts that you're having. So questions like, how do I protect myself? How do I protect others? Uh, what's going to happen with my workplace? So these are all very natural questions to be asking. And if you're asking these questions, 
then I would again encourage you to go find the facts uh, and get the answers um, as well. So fear is something that's designed to keep us safe. Uh, so it makes us take action to keep ourselves safe. But sometimes the actions that we take might be inadvertently harmful to ourselves or to others. So this can include things like uh, stigma. This can include uh, panic-like behaviors. It can include things like uh, overwatching uh, distressing sources of information. So sometimes fear uh, can be both helpful and keep us safe, but also could be harmful as well. And so it's important for us to think about how do we manage that fear. Hmm. Thank you, Aisha. And um, there's a lot of information on our website. <coughs> uh, you can go to www dot who dot int slash covid dash 19 i repeat www dot who dot int slash covid 19 <coughs> um aisha other than fear there is also a lot of discrimination and stigma uh, particularly affecting the chinese population mm -hmm. because um, the outbreak started in china mm -hmm. can you explain why this is happening and um, what is the solution? Okay. So <coughs> stigma or health related stigma is something that can arise where a sense of disapproval or shame is attributed to a person because of their association uh, with a health condition. So here we're talking about COVID. And what that does is it can result in the experiences of rejection or exclusion or acts of discrimination. And these acts of discrimination can be very harmful physically and mentally for that group. So our main message here is around the use of language to fight stigma. So words are very powerful. Words can create stigma, but that also means that words and the words that we choose to use can minimize stigma as well. So for example, one thing that we would encourage is not to attribute COVID-19 to any specific socio-demographic, so that could include, for example, ethnicity or nationality or geography. COVID-19 uh, can and has affected people uh, from various different backgrounds. It's a global issue and it's important to not attach it uh, to a particular uh, identity group because it can affect acts of discrimination towards that group or people who might be perceived as belonging to that group. So language also uh, can go beyond that as well. So we can also think about how do we use language when we talk about COVID-19? One of the things that we can do is something called uh, separating COVID-19 from the person that you're describing rather than giving them the identity by COVID-19. So in English, what I mean by this is you would prefer to say a person has COVID-19 or a person who is recovering from COVID-19 rather than attaching the label to the person, for example, a COVID-19 case, a COVID-19 family. Other examples of how we can think sensitively about our language in order to minimise stigma is to not use terms such as victims or suspected cases. Uh, these are words that can arise anxiety and so it's better to use alternative phrasing, so keeping your language as person-centred as possible. And another important way to address stigma and discrimination is to really think about messages which evoke empathy, uh, messages which invoke compassion and which invoke, evoke kindness. So one way that this could be achieved is to start sharing stories which are around uh, hope or positive messages like uh, recovery, so stories about recovery or stories about uh, loved ones supporting uh, a person who is unwell during that time or about communities supporting each other. So we've heard um, in press briefings this week some very nice stories coming from communities who have been supporting family members of health workers who are responding uh, to COVID-19. And on top of these uh, actions that are constructive that you can do, the community and the public play a huge role in tackling stigma and discrimination. So you can yourselves be advocates for using these kinds of uh, language tips that we've given 
and also for addressing any misconceptions or rumours uh, or uh, misinformation that's been spreading. So I would encourage everyone to take a role in that. This is something we can all participate in. Um, and we also have guidance uh, on the, available on the WHO website, uh, which will give you some tips on the kinds of things that you can do to tackle stigma. Great. Um, so we all have a role. Yeah, yes. Aisha. <clears throat> okay, so we actually started getting questions uh, from um, the audience. Uh, thank you for sending your questions. And I will be checking my phone every now and then and apologize for that because I need to read the questions. So Aisha, the first question is um, <clears throat> from Vasuki Vasudevan. It's a good question. As parents, how do we cope with distress yeah. um, <clears throat> following the news and all that about uh, the coronavirus? Um, and how to, how to talk with uh, children about this COVID-19? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. Uh, it's a very important thing uh, to be thinking about in terms of mental health considerations when we think about the stress that young people might be experiencing and in turn the role that parents might have it as part of alleviating that stress. So during a, a situation like this, and it very much depends on the situation in your own community, children uh, will experience stress, or oh, sorry, children can experience stress and they might present in many different ways. They could be more attached to you or more clingy uh, to you. They could be sad or crying or withdrawn or even uh, to the point of bedwetting if they're very anxious. So children express stress in different ways. And we, what we encourage is for parents to give as much love and attention and their time uh, to comforting their children if they are experiencing this. Now, children are very smart. Uh, they're very perceptive. They can tell if something is different or if something has changed. For example, perhaps you're having, as a parent who's working, perhaps you're having to work at home more and your child has noticed that, or perhaps their school has closed um, and they've noticed that as well. So children are perceptive to these changes and will naturally ask questions. What we would do is encourage you as parents or caregivers of young people to be as honest as possible with them uh, because giving children clear messages about the situation in a way that's adapted for their age can help them to understand what's going on. So remember, again, the, the idea of facts minimising fear applies to every part of the population, whether you're a young person or a parent. If, you, if you're in a situation where you're having to spend more time at home or your kids have had to come off school, we would encourage you to try to maintain as normal a routine as possible uh, for that child. So helping them to retain onto some sort of normality and if that's not possible, to create new routines, which include times for playing and times for learning, if that's possible. So there's a big role that caregivers can play in this. Um, okay. Great advice, yeah. Aisha. Thank you. <coughs> um, going back to um, individuals, people who are facing discrimination, we get mm. a question from Mehak Ayman. Um, how can we provide support to these individuals who are facing discrimination because of this coronavirus? Uh, Mahak, that's a really nice question. Um, and I'm really glad you've asked that question because it really, for me, emphasizes that all of us have a role to play when it comes to supporting those who might be additionally affected by the current situation. So in this regard, I would say to make sure that you're providing as much kindness and compassion to that person as possible. You can use uh, principles called psychological first aid principles, and that information is also available on our website, where you're giving uh, practical but emotional support uh, to that person if they need it. Uh, I also talked about before all the actions that you can take to help to tackle stigma, so around using certain types of language, and also around your role in uh, correcting any misconceptions or misinformation or misuses of language out there. So that's another activity that you could do at the higher level. If you feel that your friend uh, is really affected by this uh, experience that they've had, if they've had uh, direct discrimination, you can encourage your friend 
uh, if they need to, to reach out and seek social support from a trusted person. So that could be uh, someone in their social circle like yourself or like a, a, another friend or a family member. If needed, it can also include seeking uh, specialist support uh, from mental health and psychosocial services if they're available in your area, if your friend's well-being really declines. Good advice again. Um, <clears throat> so with this uh, coronavirus, some countries are asking people to do self-quarantine or um, or for visitor who just mm -hmm. came to do, um, who just come into the country mm -hmm. um, to be under quarantine. Um, <clears throat> I get a question from Remya Onatu. Um, what kind of uh, support we can give to uh, reduce the anxiety for people who are on quarantine? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, really important question. Uh, being in some form of isolation or quarantine is a challenging experience for your mental well-being. Um, we advocate very heavily around social support being very good for your mental health, but the idea of isolation or quarantine means that that can be a little bit limited. That's not always the case. It could be that you're self-isolating at home, but you've still got other family members or friends in the house, uh, or that you're in quarantine and that there are other people that might be accessible to you. If possible, keep maintaining your social contacts within reason, uh, if in person, according to the health guidance um, of your country. Otherwise, um, if you have this accessible to you, digital methods of communication or even phone is a really good way to keep maintaining your social contact. And it's something in particular to think about with uh, adolescents during this time. Now, when you're in isolation, um, Another important thing to do is still to continue, if possible, maintaining your routines to maintain a sense of normality. And when I say maintaining routines, this is because it includes uh, self-care strategies. So you're eating well, uh, trying to make sure you get enough rest and sleep and um, trying to get physical activity as well. So these are all things that you can do it, when you're in isolation. Um, and also activities that stimulate your mind or that are what we call cognitively stimulating can be quite good um, as well. So a number of, n number of different simple actions that you can take to help minimize stress during, during that time. Thanks, Aisha. We talked earlier about uh, children. Now we get a question from Andrea Quintal from Portugal who asked uh, how can um, she help her parents um, to, to uh, cope with their anxiety about the coronavirus. Oh, so this, is this uh, Andrea asking as a child? Uh, yes, parents? Um, parents is 66 years old. Ah, okay. So really important question. So I see we were talking about children earlier. Now we're talking about actually our parents who might be older adult population. So older adults, uh, vary uh, in many different ways. And what is important for older adults is ensuring that they have the facts and the information presented to them in a very clear way. So again, just reiterating that facts can help to minimize fear. And what can be helpful for older adults is to think about making sure that the information that they're receiving about how to protect themselves um, is clearly presented and is something that they're able to understand and implement for themselves. Um, so this is a very simple action that can be mm. taken. Similarly, all the advice about taking care of yourself, so the healthy diet, healthy uh, sleeping, healthy exercise or some form of physical activity can also be applied to older adults as well. So this can be among some of the things that you're recommending to your parents if they're in, um, if they're in that population. Now, there are um, a variety of things that we also need to think about with mm -hmm. the older adult population. Some people uh, might have a cognitive decline or a dementia. And there we need to think a little bit more about how the messages are given to ensure that they're able to protect themselves. So you might need to make adaptations. You might find that you're needing to repeat, uh, that you're presenting information more simply using simple languages or even uh, presenting it using images or pictorially. Um, this can be an important adaptation to make. Um, 
And uh, this is something that can be helpful to minimize uh, the stress of older adults at that time. Hmm. Uh, Naila Abu Malham uh, Dugani, um, I hope I read the name correctly, uh, asks about um, what about healthcare providers <laughs> who are taking patients <laughs> with uh, COVID-19? I mean, um, with the number of patients, I think they they're also affected and how can they take care of their mental health? Yeah. That's a really excellent question and I'm glad that you asked this. So healthcare workers or anyone that is responding at this moment in time in health facilities to COVID-19 are under a lot of pressure at the moment. They might be experiencing longer work hours, higher demands on them, uh, many pressures. And on top of that, the fear around COVID as well, which affects all members of the public. And this can be uh, detrimental to workers' mental health and their stress. And so it's important for um, people that are responding to recognize and be aware of the fact that it's very likely many of your colleagues feel the same way. And feeling stressed in this situation, a little bit like fear, uh, can sometimes be helpful. It's probably keeping you motivated and active in your job. And it's important to think about managing your stress as well as protecting yourself physically during the COVID-19 response, because the better your mental well-being during this time, the better capacity you will have to be able to do your job. So it is important to think about stress management as well. So again, the same things apply um, to health workers in terms of looking after yourselves as it does for all members of the population. So your self-care strategies um, around seeking social support, um, looking after your health, your diet, your physical activity, um, and also thinking about what are the strategies that you might have used before to help you cope with stress. Many of you might not have experienced a situation like COVID-19 before, that's okay. The situation may be different, but the strategies for managing stress are the same. And it's really important as well um, for health workers to think about, and, and everyone, to think about minimizing strategies which might not be very helpful for you. So these are things that feel really good in the short term, like uh, having alcohol or having um, tobacco or drugs, but actually in the long term don't benefit your mental well-being. So many things that health workers can think about, but on top of that, uh, we are talking about a workplace situation where health workers have managers or leaders of health facilities. Mm -hmm. So it's also important for managers to think about the idea that protecting their health workers from chronic stress will benefit that worker. Encouraging things such as taking breaks um, so encouraging them and modelling them can be very helpful for your health worker population. Um, rotating workers from high stress to low stress functions or pairing experienced workers with inexperienced workers or other forms of the buddy system can be really helpful. And just like everybody else, making sure that your team uh, that are responding to COVID are kept up to date with the information. So that's all the members of your team. This can really help with managing stress at the time. And finally, that managers themselves are probably under undue pressure in this, in this moment. So it's important for them to model self-care strategies so it benefits them and is a good uh, representation to their workers. Great. Um, we're getting a lot of interesting questions. I think people are asking for a different um, group of the population. Okay. Um, we have a question from Heather Dawson who asks, um, so as a mental health practitioner, how do we control the anxiety of those who are most vulnerable? For example, the homeless, um, substance addicted and severely mentally ill. Yeah. Yeah, really nice question, Heather, about what, how do we best support people who are currently experiencing mental health or substance use conditions or who might be at risk of experiencing stress, such as the homeless population? I think at this time, it's very important to make sure that those people who are experiencing uh, mental health and substance use conditions still have access to the treatment that they need, whether that's uh, in-person medical treatment or psychological treatment or medication treatment, that it's important that that support is still in place during this time. 
Um, and that's something really important to think about, particularly around where people might have to self-isolate. So as I said earlier, a situation like this can really exacerbate uh, the stress of the population and can really exacerbate stress or potentially lead to relapse for people who do have existing conditions. So it's important to ensure that that care is still in place and that mental health uh, practitioners or mental health and psychosocial support practitioners are well placed to provide this support. Many practitioners might not have had the experience of being in a public health emergency like this and I would encourage them to get some training to make sure that they are having the capacity to respond to people at this time. Um, so those are some of uh, the messages to think about um, in, in this scenario. Thanks Aisha. Um, there is also a question from uh, Carlos Rivera Rosario. Thank you for your question. Um, this is about employers. Mm. Uh, how can employers work with their employees uh, for mental health in the workplace yeah. in relation to COVID-19? Yeah, great question, Carlos. So um, again, what's important in the workplace is the role that employers can play in disseminating information that can help with uh, various aspects of the response to COVID-19, whether that's information about how you protect yourself physically, so for example, the hand washing and so forth, um, but also how employees can be protected from their stress management as well. So previously, we've encouraged that employees have an active role in this, whether it's disseminating that information by email or having posters up. The same should be done for stress management as well. And on top of that, fundamentally, this is around your employees having access to factual, uh, credible, up-to-date information. So encouraging uh, accessing those resources is something that employers can do as well, because facts will help um, with answering the questions that your employees might have. And providing forums um, to have conversations provide an opportunity for employees to ask questions can also be something that's very beneficial at this time to uh, address the questions that your employees might be having that might be causing them some anxiety. Hmm. Um, there's a question from Tenzin Chokra um, asking about, um, what about meditation for those who are stressed uh, with, with mm -hmm. COVID-19? Yeah. Would that be helpful? Really nice question. Something that we encourage is strategies that you have used in the past, uh, which have you have found to be helpful to you, which have helped you to relax or to minimize your stress or minimize anxiety, would really strongly encourage carrying on with those activities as long as they are helpful and safe for you. So meditation could be one of those activities and there are many other activities that people might have found has been helpful in the past for them to manage stress and is something that they can implement now. Um, so I think that's a, a very nice message um, and a, another example of positive actions that people can take, uh, something that can be shared and, and, and in, encouraged in others. Uh, another interesting question from uh, Juan Carlos uh, Lopez in Madrid, I believe, um, who asked in relation of uh, schools being closed, um, either because their case, uh, there is a, a confirmed uh, COVID-19 uh, patient or as a precautionary. Mm -hmm. Um, his question is how to reduce fear about uh, COVID-19 uh, among students and possible bullying mm -hmm. consequences for children who are infected with okay. COVID-19. It's an interesting question. Very interesting question, Juan. And I'm making the assumption that with the way that you've asked the question, that you're talking about a school that hasn't closed yet. So you're talking about situations where or students- Or maybe after. Or maybe afterwards. Mm -hmm. So uh, situations where there might be bullying. So really important point. And actually ties into it, what we've been talking about earlier in this conversation, which is around stigma and stigma having an impact on the acts of discrimination that people can take. And bullying uh, between young people is one of those examples. So if a school is still in session, this is an opportunity for schools to be able to disseminate the information which helps to tackle stigma. So these are the things we were talking about earlier around not attaching COVID-19 to any particular socio-demographic or nationality or geography because by doing so, we can um, 
increase the likelihood of discrimination towards people who identify from those groups or who are perceived to be identifying from those groups. Um, so there's, that's one aspect of it. Now, if school's not in session, this is something that um, parents or caregivers of young people can address as well. So addressing um, how to manage the fear around uh, COVID-19. So encouraging young people in a way that's adapted to that person's developmental ability and their understanding around what the facts are, how to protect yourself and, and methods for managing uh, well-being and stress. So for example, maintaining your routines, uh, maintaining a healthy lifestyle at home and encouraging times for play and uh, learning if that's possible. Um, and ad additionally, social support as well. So keeping in as much contact um, with each other, if not in person, then digitally, if that's an option. If your, young, uh, if your child or if a person that you know has experienced bullying or continues to experience bullying in the community and it's something that is causing them a lot of distress because we know there's a link between bullying and mental health, then I would really encourage um, social support around that person and for that person to seek further support through local services and local providers um, to help them manage the distress that they're experiencing. Great. Um, there's a question uh, uh, from Twitter uh, about the news on coronavirus because um, mm -hmm. there's so, ma so many uh, reporting about this coronavirus um, and it affects people when they watch, when mm -hmm. they hear. Uh, how, to, how to react to all this news yeah. <laughs> around us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great question. There's so much information out there at the moment. And for some people, actually, it's quite normal. <laughs> Uh, to have so much information coming at us and be quite overwhelmed by it. And in fact, some people can find the news very distressing at this moment in time. So we would really encourage as well, as part of managing fear and stress in COVID-19, to minimise, if it's something that distresses you, to minimise the amount of times that you are exposing yourself to news or media. And you could even consider limiting your setting a target to limit yourself, uh, for example, one to two times a day only. Um, something just to reflect on with the news as well is just to remember that the, the numbers and the, the information that's coming through, uh, these are numbers, but we are talking about people and people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that is just something to reflect on uh, when trying to think about how do we make sure that we have empathy and kindness as part of our response to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Um, and a question from uh, Jenny Chung um, about uh, the panic buying mm -hmm. when people are buying toilet papers, pasta, canned food. Um, why do people behave this way? Mm -hmm. And should they actually? What should they do? Okay. So I said earlier that fear is something that our, we're all designed to experience. Fear because fear is something that can help to keep us safe. And fear is something that we experience in the face of perceived or actual danger, um, or where, the, where there's uncertainty, something unknown, something unclear. So fear can sometimes lead us to take actions which help to keep ourselves safe. And sometimes it can lead us to actions which might not be beneficial for us and might not be beneficial for others. So this is something that fear does. Um, if we're experiencing a lot of fear and engaging in actions which perhaps aren't helpful or necessary for ourselves or indeed for the benefit of our communities, um, it's, it's something that uh, uh, it makes sense in the context of the situation. Um, but the advice around um, this is to think about what are the facts uh, at the moment? What does the information say about what you need to do to protect yourself? And I think the advice is around making sure you have sufficient resources should you have to self-isolate, mm -hmm. uh, which is for a period of 14 days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here is an interesting question that probably some of us experience this day. It's from Twitter. Uh, my fear is about coughing in public. People look at you with suspicion. How can I approach or manage a situation like that? <laughs> That's a, it's a, that's a very interesting question as well. Uh, I think it's an anxiety that is indeed shared by many people. Um, the, the, 
important thing here uh, is um, you don't necessarily need to take responsibility for managing other people's responses to you. I think ultimately, as long as you're following the protection procedures and the coughing etiquette, uh, so on that's been advocated by WHO, that's what's important um, in this situation. Um, so um, other people, I hope you are aware um, of, of the advice that uh, WHO has been issuing around how to protect yourself, uh, for example, good coughing etiquette. Um, but it's not, it's not something that we cannot always manage the response towards other people. But this is part of why addressing the stigma around COVID-19 is, is important. Uh, it is uh, flu season at the moment. Many people do have uh, coughs and sniffles. And when we are talking about coughing etiquette, it means coughing to your elbow or cover it with uh, tissue. And then after that, um, to throw it away immediately in a, in a bin, uh, a closed bin. Right. Um, so um, one last question is uh, also from Twitter. Uh, so how can people be made aware not to fear stigma and to act logically? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not <coughs> only for themselves, but also uh, for others. Um, so not affecting other mental yeah. health uh, well-being yeah it's a good uh, closing yeah. question it's a re this is a great closing question so overall we're thinking about um managing fear during covid but in turn also managing stigma so first of all it's very normal to be experiencing fear and stress during this time facts uh facts on how you protect yourself uh how you can protect others are the solution to any misinformation or rumors uh, which can be part of perpetuating some of the stigma um, at this time. And self-care strategies are the way to address your mental health um, and your stress and manage your well-being at this time. And should you experience a deterioration to make sure that you do go seek specialist support if needed. Minimising the amount of time that you're exposed to news, if it is something that's distressing you, is important. But also to manage stigma, thinking about managing your language. So not using uh, terms that attribute stigma onto a particular group of people. And also thinking about how to promote empathetic, um, positive messages so around recovery, stories around people who've uh, supported another person uh, during this time. These can be helpful messages uh, that all the community can participate in um, to help promote mental well-being and reduce stigma uh, at this moment in time while we're all responding uh, to COVID-19. Thank you, Aisha. And thank you for everyone who have joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, people around the world uh, joining our live from South Sudan, Myanmar, Italy, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Portugal, Thailand, Romania, Kazakhstan, Australia, Denmark, Singapore, Indonesia, Mongolia, Costa Rica, China, Austria, South Africa, Jamaica, Namibia, Uganda, Pakistan, Cambodia, and many more. Um, so we are all in this together and we all have a role to play as uh, Aisha said. So uh, also as our Director General, Dr. Tedra said, it's solidarity and not stigma. For more information, you can go to our website, www.who.int slash COVID-19. Uh, thank you again, Aisha Malik, and thank I'm you. sorry, Satyogi. Thank you, and uh, keep uh, joining our live next time. Mm -hmm.